Okay, so I predefined quality specifications as tolerance limits for my daily QC data and set rules accordingly. Just pick which best fits for you. We know that we may have, in, in this subject and some of these questions, we may have some language differences. We, we struggled with this over the last uh, couple days to get this exactly right, and we'll see. Okay, always predominant answer. So this subject will be, uh, will be easy. What is the main method you use for determining quality specifications for your quality planning? And if you don't know from these, then I would select other. Okay. So a good distribution between biological variation and associated databases and uh, performance achieved during original method evaluation. What is the main strategy you use to minimize bias in your laboratory? Interesting. Nearly 50% said use only methods that are traceable to higher metrological materials and methods. This one I think will come up in discussion. We had some wording just to take it as it is, answer uh, uh, what it means for you. But does it make sense to create a combined analytical quality specifications for bias and imprecision together into a total error? You know this is the last segment before lunch, right? Okay. Two seconds. At twelve percent is can't think anymore. Good. Almost, almost. Uh, so we'll welcome the next uh, our next panelist to the uh, to the dais. I, I have to tell you that we we solicited the speakers for a little bit of introduction about uh, how I could introduce them, and I, I know many of them and and such. And, and I'm going to read exactly what uh, what Dr. Fraser put. Uh, Callum Fraser from Dundee in Scotland, whom you all know. Thank you very much. I present you Dr. <laughs> Fraser. <laughs> yeah. That's... Thanks very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here in Cologne to talk to you about quality specifications. And I come from Dundee in Scotland, which is Scotland's fourth city. Uh, you can see a picture of our beautiful setting by the River Tay at the bottom right. 
And I've been a clinical biochemist for well over 40 years, nearly 30 of them in Dundee in Ninewells Hospital Medical School at the top left, and lately uh, commissioning the Scottish Bowel Screening Laboratory, which is also in Dundee, shown in the top right. And some of you would probably like to join me in the bottom left, and especially on a nice day like this, but it's really great to be here, and I don't mind giving up a few days sailing to be with you here today. Quality specifications is the remit of Carmen Perique and myself, and you'll note that in the programme there are two questions to cover this session. And the first is, can we encourage labs to predefine quality goals? And that's actually an easy question to answer. Predefined means defined before, of course, and there is no doubt that there's only one answer to this question. Laboratories must define quality goals a priori, since these are necessary prerequisites for undertaking quality planning to decide the number of controls and the rules. And ISO 15189 states quite clearly, the laboratory shall design internal quality control systems that verify the attainment of the intended quality. So you have to define quality a priori. The second question is rather more difficult. Is there a compromise position regarding the use of biological variation, total error, and uncertainty of measurement or measurement uncertainty? And this is a difficult question because does a conflict really exist that requires a compromise? And I personally think there isn't a conflict that total error and measurement uncertainty are rather different conceptually and biological variation data are applicable to both. Now, setting quality specifications in the laboratory is difficult. There's no doubt about that, especially since there are many published recommendations. Further new recommendations keep being published. Test results are used in many different settings. It is said that neither patients nor clinicians are harmed by our current performance. And I must say the manufacturers also don't seem to use anything but the state of the art for use in either development of marketing and use phrases such as as good as, better than, and so on, looking at what is attainable or what has been attained. Because of these difficulties, some years ago now, my friend Per Peterson, who unfortunately can't be with us today because he's undergoing fairly major surgery this Friday, he and I sat down and tried to put some order into the chaos which resulted in the publication of an editorial in Clinical Chemistry which suggested the idea of putting strategies to set quality specifications into a hierarchy. And as you will all know, in Stockholm, there was a consensus conference the year after, sponsored by IFCC, IUPAC, and the World Health Organization, which looked at the concepts and set the Stockholm hierarchy into place, where strategies to set analytical quality specifications were placed in order of goodness. So at the top, assessment of the effect of analysis on specific clinical decision-making, specific clinical settings, is the ultimate. But that's difficult, and so assessment of the effect of analysis on general clinical decision-making, i.e. using biological variation, is the second in the hierarchy, and as we've just seen, is very popular. Clinicians' views on changes also makes use of biological variation data, but it's only been done in a few uh, interesting uh, areas, particularly by Sferi Sandberg and his colleagues. Third in the hi hierarchy are professional recommendations, guidelines from usually professional bodies, and very often they are now biological variation based. Further down in the hierarchy are quality specifications laid down by proficiency testing or EQS organizers. And again, these are more and more over time becoming biological variation based. And finally, we have, if there's nothing else, published data on the state of the art. Now, no one thinks that the hierarchy is perfect and it certainly be, shouldn't be seen as monolithic set in stone. There is, throughout the hierarchy, an inconsistency in approach. Some of the strategies give 
goals for imprecision, some give goals for bias, some for total error. But so far, none are for measurement uncertainty. Moreover, between subject biological variation is used in many of the current methods for determining analytical quality specifications for allowable bias. However, you can vary for many quantities between subject biological variation by partitioning the population according to, for example, gender or age. So you can make within subject between subject biological variation of different magnitudes depending on how you treat the population. However, within subject biological variation is much more constant both theoretically and in reality. Another problem is that analytical quality specifications differ markedly with the strategy used for derivation. And even when the strategy is at the same level in the hierarchy, you can get quite different analytical quality specifications depending upon how you use the strategy. And very, very importantly, strategies for calculation of combinations of imprecision and bias, i.e. total error, vary significantly. Just an example of some of the problems are problems with using EQAS or PT allowable limits. And here, uh, there are for four quantities widely done in laboratory medicine. These are the allowable limits from the US, from the CLIA, based upon biological variation. The Australian Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia in Germany, the Rillebach, and from the Czech Republic. And you can see that these are very, very different. And it is really quite difficult to understand why different EUQA schemes have apparently very, very different levels of acceptability. And as we will discuss this afternoon, perhaps harmonization is needed and is achievable. The traditional approach, of course, is that often attributed to Jim Westgard, where he has imprecision, which is random error, and we estimate that, as you know, from internal quality control. Inaccuracy or bias, systematic error, estimate from method comparison studies or external quality assessment schemes or proficiency testing. So total error represents the overall or total error that may occur in a test result both due to imprecision and bias, random and systematic errors. And total error is usually created as the modulus of bias, that's bias ignoring the sign, plus the standard deviation multiplied by a coverage factor depending on the probability. So this, according to some, is a linear sum and to others it would be seen as adding an apple and a pear or an apple and an orange. It's a very common strategy to use this sort of formula to set total allowable error. So the total allowable error based upon biological variation is less than a quarter times the group biological variation that's within and between the subject. That is the desirable or allowable error for bias plus 1.65, which is to give 95% probability, times one half of the within subject biological variation, which is the desirable goal for imprecision. Now, we all know that if we use this formula, some of the quality specifications generated are very, very difficult to obtain with current technology and methodology, for example, for sodium, chloride, and calcium. And should we stop doing these tests because they don't meet analytical quality specifications based upon biological variation? No, because we do get clinically useful data. Some quality specifications, for example, for triglycerides or enzyme activities, are very easy to achieve. So should we let the quality slip? And again, the answer is no, since there are many, many advantages to having error which is lower, or uncertainty, which is lower than that set by the analytical quality specifications. And of course, we can have multi-levels, and there's a multi-level model which uses different multipliers 
optimum desirable minimum. And at our 2011 convention, as you'll see in the preprint, which is in your packs, we suggested that there might be an ideal, a fourth level of analytical quality specifications based upon biology. So let's now turn, turn to the more interesting, perhaps, uncertainty of measurement. And we have, we have already seen, it's quite clearly stated in ISO 15189, the laboratory shall determine the uncertainty of results where relevant and possible. And you've already seen the definitions for uncertainty, a parameter associated with the results of measurement, which characterizes the dispersion of values that can be reasonably attributed to the measurand. And clearly the intent of ISO is to make measurements transferable or comparable over time and geography. And this requires elimination or correcting biases. And as we've already nicely seen this morning, adding together the uncertainties as variances. Our remit was total error versus measurement uncertainty. But I think that rather than defining an allowable total error with estimated elements of all types of random and systematic error, in my opinion, where possible, all results should be corrected for known biases and should have a estimate of measurement uncertainty attached. And if you want a really good, easy guide to measurement uncertainty, I highly recommend this article on Jim Westgar's website done by Graham White from Flinders Medical Centre in Adelaide, who I work with in Aberdeen and Australia, and has done a tremendous amount to try and translate the real difficulties of uncertainty of measurement into practical information and practical tools for us, the practicing laboratorian. So Graham said I could show his summary of his article. So remember, total error provides an approximate worst case value for the error of a measuring system, a worst case value. Total error does not recognize that each individual patient's result could have possible outcomes with less error than bias plus Z times the standard deviation. Total error is useful for setting upper limits of allowable error, but measurement uncertainty is not concerned with estimating the total error of a measuring system. Measurement uncertainty, as we've already seen, is concerned with estimating an interval of values within which the true value of a measured analyte or measurand is believed to lie with a stated level of confidence. And again, we'll have to state very categorically that known bias, if we measure the bias, why incorporate it into total error? Why not get rid of it? So eliminate or minimize bias. Measurement uncertainty, as you've seen, consists of a single measurement result it's the best estimate of the true value and centers on it, the dispersion of results. So we're here to talk about analytical quality specifications. So what's the strategy for measurement uncertainty? Well, as we've kept saying, bias should be minimized. So the analytical quality specification for bias can only be zero. And that's certainly not a new idea. And I found way back when in the dim history of my life that I'd actually written down the ultimate analytical goal for inaccuracy is that there should be no bias. And that was quite a long time ago, as you'll see. There are also good reasons for making measurement uncertainty as small as possible to make the dispersion of each test result small, which allows Population reference intervals to be narrower, makes reference change values, as we've seen from Graham, smaller, makes changes seen in serial results of higher significance, it minimizes result misclassification when we're using decision limits, and so on and so forth. Make measurement uncertainty small. How small? Well, the optimum Analytical quality specification for random variation is, as we've seen before, uh, first talk this morning, less than a quarter of the within-subject biological variation. And this means 
that the total variation will not be confounded very much by test result variability, only about 3%. And as you've seen, there are other ways that you can do it. However, you can't really forget about bias, although it'd be nice to do so. And I've always thought that we could divide bias into two. Systematic bias, which is methodological bias, which should be minimized, got rid of by a variety of strategies, and random bias, which is the bias that does occur as we go on when we have changes in lots of calibrator and reagents and so on and so forth. However, the estimates of random bias are, of course, included in the longer term analysis of imprecision, which is what you should use to determine the measurement uncertainty in your laboratories in the model according to Graham White and others. So finally, let's think again about how could we define using biological variation, what else? A quality specification for total measurement uncertainty. As we've seen, the simplest optimum quality specification for inherent random variation is less than a quarter of the biological variation. The analytical quality specifi specifications for changes in random bias is less than a third of the biological variation, as you can read about in the preprint. So therefore, when you add these two variances together, the total allowable measurement uncertainty is, and here's something new for you, have a think about this. So our new quality specification is, measurement uncertainty should be less than 0.4 times the within subject biological variation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Fraser. Uh, next is Dr. Perish from Barcelona and uh, one of the original members of the Analytical Quality Commission with Dr. Carmen Ricos and has been involved for more than 20 years in the subject. Welcome. Thank you. The, the, the slides? Oh. <laughs> At first, thank you very much to BioRat for, for inviting me to participate in this meeting. I strongly believe that the main quality goal in the laboratory should be to satisfy clinical needs. Therefore, you should use analytical quality specifications in order to assure that if we ful fulfill them, we satisfy the clinical general needs for diagnosis and monitoring. Setting quality specifications based on biological variation are still valid today, as was shown in previous BioRat meetings. They state acceptable limits for the three main sources of variation of laboratory results, imprecision, bias, and total error. For these reasons, this talk deals with three main points. The 2012 Biological Variation Database what is new, what is changed, how to manage when existence of bias is evident. And last, what information can be obtained from quality specifications for total error? First point, in January this year, the Analytical Quality Commission of Spanish Society of Clinical Chemistry carried out the sixth edition of the database on biological variation published at the Westgar website. An in-depth revision was made, checking the reliability of the data collected through a review of criteria used since the first edition to include articles in the database. These criteria were inclusion of all known components of biological variation in healthy people for each analyte, Express as intra-individual or inter-individual coefficients of variation and calculating the median of all values compiled. Exclusion of articles not specifically designed to estimate biological variation components. Exclusions, exclusion of articles with low reliability. The reliability index 
was calculated, was calculated by this formula. And low reliability is considered to be an index higher than one. Using the ANOVA or the proposed formula from Harris and Fraser as mathematical model to estimate the components of biological variation. Any article that didn't sufficiently describe what model had been used was excluded. In the sixth, in the sixth edition, we made some modifications and exceptions to this criteria. Inclusion of articles with low reliability index when no other papers existed. This affected the following, the following analytes. Factor 5 coagulation, troponin T, and noradrenaline. Including papers from patients with can cancer disease in a stable remission state for some tumor markers, alpha fetus protein, SCC antigen, TPS antigen, because no data from healthy people is available. Moreover, separation of data from different biological systems that had been joined by error in previous editions. Last but not least, when an analyte is updated, if there are If there are many previous, already, previous values already compiled in the database, as this example of creatinine with more than 40 articles published, The current median doesn't change because uh, new values fall within the existing uh, distribution of results. In the other extreme, if there are few new values as a, as a free tyroxine, uh, new data lies outside of the initial distribution and the median changes. In this case, from 7.6 to 5.7. In this way, in this way, <laughs> okay. In this way, we incorporate uh, 45 new analytes, and now the database includes 369 analytes available in two free uh, uh, websites, in, in English and in Spanish. Second point, what to do when existence of bias is evident? Biological variation database is used to define analytical quality specifications for imprecision, bias, and total error. Imprecision has been improved somewhat because analytical performance has been improved too. However, there has been no parallel improvement regarding bias. Now, the main focus is bias. We can minimize bias, or bias should be near of zero. This is a good goal, but unrealistic today. Only in monitoring patients, we can assume that bias is zero. However, in many cases, laboratory results are used for diagnosis or screening, and then the effect of analytical bias mainly determines the percentage of misclassified individuals in healthy or disease. Moreover, when ignoring the use of the analytical request, the laboratory should fulfill the more restrictive requirement. The existence of bias may be evidence in the laboratory when testing commutable materials that have values assigned with reference methods. In the next two slides, I can show you some examples of sources of bias manifested through a pilot equa scheme made in Spain in collaboration with the SCALM Dutch program. Uh, this is like 
show the deviation of each laboratory from reference method of creatinine at 80 millimoles liter, a clinically relevant concentration. Green lines correspond to desirable specification of total error. All users of the Jaffe non-compensated methods show positive bias, whereas all users of the, uh, Jaffe, comp the Jaffe compensated methods and enzymatic would give satisfactory results. <laughs> In this slide, you can see the individual laboratory deviation from reference method of calcium at different concentration levels. Green lines here correspond to minimum, the, the minimum specification of total error. The majority of the results from laboratories using a routine calibrator traceable to the NIST RM915 standard give low results in red. This standard is an equal solution which is non-commutable with human serum, so the traceability chain has been broken. When using serum-based standard for traceability, results blue and green, the results obtained in routine laboratories are satisfactory. In this example, bias is due to the lack of calibrator traceability. Bias only can be corrected with collaboration of manufacturers of analytical systems. We need a standardized methods with traceable calibrators to primary standard using commutable control materials with assigned values to reference methods. The previous examples prove that up to now, we have to accept that bias exists and we have to know the level of bias and whether it fulfills specifications. And the last point, what information can be obtained from quality specifications for total error? We can directly measure total error when making a single test of a control sample with known target value. This happens when participa participating in some EQS programs. Since 2007, the SEC ICOA program is in Spanish, but I think it's, it's comprehensible. Uh, the program show, shows in the monthly report the laboratory des deviation in percentage from the peer group in comparison with the limit of, uh, of a specification of total error uh, based on biological variation. We use three already known, known levels, desirable, minimum, and optimum, depending on the analyte reported. In this slide, you can see the percentage of analytes included at different levels of total error specifications in our program. Specification desi desirable, 51% of analytes Minimum, 11%. Optimum, 9%. In the annual evaluation, we report the percentage of participant results reaching specifications for each analyte included in the program. For example, you can see the percentage of laboratories that fulfill specifications for analytes of basic serum biochemistry program. For analytes with more stringent specification like uh, sodium and chloride, only 60 to 7% of participant results reach specifications. And on the contrary, for analytes with wither specifications like enzymes or iron, all laboratories reach specifications. In the last BioRed meeting, a new fourth level of, of specification named IDEAL was suggested for analytes with very good performance, better than the optimum specification. 
Maybe the names minimum, desirable, optimum, and ideal should be to change to scores one to four, according to the Six Sigma terminology. Our project for the end of this year is to evaluate participant results in relation to the level four or ideal specification for those analytes with 95% or more results fulfilling the optimum specification last year. Examples of candidate analytes are shown here about uh, basic uh, biochemistry in serum, urine, or some tumor markers, like PC, for example. We believe that this is a good option to stimulate continuous improvement in clinical laboratories. I finally, in conclusion, Biological variation components are well known for 369 analytes. However, the service catalog of a routine laboratory contains around 1,000 of analytes. Thus, I encourage you to follow up this type of study, and I hope that in the next edition of the database, the number of analytes will significantly rise. Clinical laboratories should demand that suppliers provide more accurate methods, clear and complete information regarding traceability of calibrators to minimize bias, which may be an important difficulty when making correct decisions on patient's care. And the last, quality managers and equa organizers should stimulate continuous quality improvement in the clinical laboratory. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, again, there's a, uh, another great example of the work that we've done in the past in the, some of our working groups kind of coming to fruition. It's, it's really kind of an exciting, um, exciting that this body has, has had that, and I look forward to seeing the continued work in, uh, in, in um, evaluating against the fourth specification. So we have a, a few minutes until lunch, about four minutes and 15 seconds. If there's uh, uh, any comment or additional discussion, um, about quality specifications. Yes. Red dress. I like my label as red. <laughs> well, just a few minutes ago when we've been voting for uh, who defines the you know, quality goal for the labs, mm -hmm. uh, was one of the labs said, yes, we do that. But is it true statement that we define analytical goal? Um, I think it's not true. Because simply what we do, we allocate the current performance to one of the, for example, biological variation levels. Simply because once the assay being designed by the manufacturer and being released to the market, there is no power on this earth to make us change the CV to less than what has been stated by the manufacturer or change the bias. So I think the way forward from here, it is the organizations within biochemistry in Europe and the United States to agree analytical quality or analytical goal and that develops, deliver analytical clinical need and that should be shared with the manufacturer to design their essay. But what we're doing in the lab is not defining. We do and we measure and uncertainty, which is the right thing. We say, and this is our variability. And unless there will be global, I guess, answer for this, it, we are not going to move forward. So. Panelists, any comment or? Not sure I actually understood all that you said, um, but I don't think that getting professional groups to define what is acceptable and what is unacceptable is a good way to go because most professional groups and most clinical guidelines end up with very empirical ideas about what ideal performance or what acceptable performance should be attained to facilitate clinical decision making. And we are scientists 
And I think, therefore, that the scientific sort of approach is using fractions of within, and not so much, between subject biological variation, have a lot of merits. And rather than spending time uh, discussing um, rather nebulous professional concepts, I think that, as Carmen said, it would be better to spend efforts generating more data and better data on biological variation and looking at ways in which, in the laboratory, you seem to say that you buy a method and that's it. Well, I'm not sure I would agree with that either. If that were the case in external quality assessment and PT schemes, you would see that every laboratory would get the same standard of performance, and that clearly is not the case. There are very good laboratories who can achieve very, very much superior quality than inferior laboratories using exactly the same methodology, exactly the same instrument, exactly the same analytical systems and reagents. Why is that? Because the better laboratories have perhaps better trained staff, they've instituted good QC, they have strategies for quality improvement, continuous quality improvement and so on. So saying you buy something off the shelf and that's what you get, I think is, is not quite correct. And if we as laboratory professionals used our talents, our knowledge, our experience to keep on pressing the manufacturers on one hand, but also the laboratory staff on the other hand, we would improve uh, systems quite markedly. <coughs> Does that answer some of your points? Well, I think we have to choose from what's available in the market. So, for example, creatinine assay, Jaffe versus enzymatic, it happens now we have good assay enzymatic, so there are good labs which choose the enzymatic and they can deliver what's required for the clinical need. But up to, say, 15 years ago, we didn't have it. We just had Jaffe and we had to live with it. And what I'm saying here, we need more dynamic relationship and interaction with the manufacturer because actually we choose it from what's there in the market. If it's not there, the technical capability is not there, we can't do anything about it until the manufacturer comes with something better. Mm -hmm. Troponin, another example. Actually, troponin is a great example. Two years back, I think NAB came out with a best practice guideline that said uh, the troponin should have a CV of 10% uh, or less than 10%. And the manufacturers started scrambling to see who could be the first one out with an assay to meet that guideline. Where did the 10% come from? <laughs> well, I, I know where it came from. It came from an, a group of experts, not very knowledgeable people, but it's based upon um, empiricism. It's not scientific, it's not objective. And having these sort of guys, if you look around at the literature, 3%, 5%, 10%, 15%, these are very, very, very common. And they're not scientific. And I would stress again, that we all here are scientists, and we ought to be basing our judgments upon, if we can, on good theoretical foundations and good numerical evidence. I, I guess the other, one, one of the other ways that we can influence it is, is by our purchasing decisions. And I, I can certainly remember going through the performance of a whole bunch of analyzers against biological variation yes, and, and yes, choosing and, and trying hard to just and thinking very carefully about justifying that decision about if there was a cost gradient to go that. If we don't reward companies for producing more precise things, oh, well, we let our, our uh, finance people overrule us, they, the companies will respond to what we can buy. And in the end, it does come, do we really think it's important enough to have that low precision, if that's what we're looking at? Uh, and if so, we have to reward companies by doing it. I guess the other comment I'd make is just on the, the EQA limits that where it is possible to subdivide them into bias and precision separately, then that provides the, you know, bias, I absolutely agree, is the issue that we've got to deal with now. Um, it's the one which is affecting more clinical decisions. And if we can look at the, the effect of the bias in there, then that's how we're going to make the improvements. That's down the aisle, Dr. Fuentes. Thank you. My comment is for those quantities that need uh, biological reference values to be interpreted. In these cases, but 
that means the most cases, uh, I think that the more important requirement is that the metrological, metrological quality affecting the reference values should be, or must be, the same that metrological uh, quality that is currently in the laboratory. If there is a, a difference between these two kinds of, of qual metrological quality, the interpretation will be bad interpretation in all cases. That means that philosophically, the, the main requirement is that both uh, reference, biological reference values and um, the current measurements must be the same metrological quality. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And this is one of the reasons that I think that this current move in many countries towards what is called harmonization of reference values or reference ranges as they're incorrectly called by many is a piece of nonsense and scientifically totally unsound. It may look good to say all our laboratories use the same reference intervals, but using different, unless we get rid of bias and we all have the same sort of measurements and we then reassess reference intervals properly, then I think that perhaps uh, some of the countries who are spending lots of time and lots of effort in making up common reference intervals is actually quite mistaken. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that, being a metrologist at heart. Seeing <laughs> <laughs> okay. none. I think... I think you've raised a really important issue there, Callum. I think scientifically there is a lot to be said for having independent reference intervals in different laboratories. The reality is that we all use different reference intervals and most of us don't, I'll say us, uh, I think that's right, most of us don't calculate what the reference intervals are for the populations that we're looking after. If you look at the EQA data, you will say, you see that laboratories that use the same methods use different reference intervals. And it would suggest that the reference intervals that we're currently quoting, and we, I'm using a generalization, are not, are not a, really very valid. So I think harmonization is a way of starting to say, let's help the clinicians understand what reference intervals are, because we're currently giving them the wrong information. And it's a pragmatic move to harmonize reference intervals, and I'm sure that's the right thing to do until we are good enough to be able to produce the right values. I suspect that the variability in laboratory practice and the variability between methods means that that will never, ever happen. But that's sub a subject we will argue about afterwards over lunch, I suspect. <laughs> okay. Any, uh, any last comments before we head to lunch? Rob? I'm very sorry to hear this from Callum and also uh, uh, from Julian. I think we should go to harmonization, but we should have a proper system lying below that. We should go to reference, traceable uh, to reference methods. We should have good materials, so we should have commutable materials, and then we get rid of the bias and we can see how good a laboratory is. I, 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 I'm afraid I also disagree with Nudar, that's, that's a question of life, which I, I'm doing now. Um, uh, laboratories differ, even if you have the same methods. There are good laboratories, I agree with Callum on that, uh, there are good laboratories uh, with the same method that, that can uh, be within the limits and there are laboratories without, uh, outside of that limits. But we should harmonize and go to common reference intervals. Uh, we need good materials for that. We need good equal schemes for that. And that's what we are working uh, on in the Netherlands. And I think we are almost there, at least in our small country. Uh, uh, and I hope you support that, uh, because I, I listen to your words, and you say it's, it's nonsense, the harmonization of inter refer common reference intervals. I don't think it's nonsense. I think we should do so. I totally agree with you. And what I meant, not that harmonization and improvement 
so that results are transferable over time and geography. That obviously, that is an extremely laudable aim with which I agree. What I was criticizing was the current approach, which is getting the good old boys round in a room and making them up. Okay, they're not made up entirely because the good old boys are professionals. They've had lots of experience in both analysis and in clinical decision making and often in clinical practice, our chemical pathologists, especially at the moment. So it's not totally unfounded, but it's not what you're doing. And if uh, other countries did what you were doing in the Netherlands, then I would stand up and applaud. What I deprecate is the current efforts which are unscientific. I can eat in, in Okay. <laughs> Very good. And I, I claim to, I will not be one of those good old boys, I promise. So, um, are we ready to eat? We're ready for lunch? Uh, we'll be back at 2 o'clock. Uh, the lunch, Gianni, is in the restaurant or is it this way? In the restaurant. Good. Thank you. <laughs>